All right, we are in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, and we're going to have a, a study on the heathen. Three things about them particularly, their abomination, their gods, and their prayers. Now, if you go through the scriptures, you will find that there are three words that God uses to address people who are other than Jews. And these three words are Gentiles, nations, and heathen. The Gentiles, of course, refers to those who are different racially than the Israelites. The nations refer to those who are from a different region or they're regionally uh, separate and distinct from the Jews. And the heathen means there are those who have a separate religion. Now we're going to go through and just show you several different scriptures that pertain to these three points. So uh, Ephesians chapter 2, we'll start with verse number 11, where the Apostle Paul uses the word Gentiles. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, now again, with the use of the word Gentiles, we have a reference, an emphasis to a racial difference, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. So the term Gentiles actually is a term used by the Bible to differentiate the races. You are not from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, one of the twelve. Now remember that uh, Abraham did have some other sons and they are considered uh, Gentiles as well. And the reason being is that they are not genetically locked between these uh, three men and uh, the twelve sons of Jacob. So the term Gentiles is a bona fide scriptural term. All right, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 2 and point 2. And it is the reference to the word nations. Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse number 25. This day will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations. Now note, it says that are under the whole heaven. In other words, uh, anyone who is not uh, directly located in the land of Palestine itself is considered upon the earth. And of course you have uh, an umbrella uh, that covers the earth. It's called the heavens or atmosphere. So a nation is one that is considered somewhere else on the planet earth aside from those who live on the land called Palestine. Turn to chapter 14 in this very same book. And verse number two. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord has chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself. Now note, this time it says above all the nations that are upon the earth. And again, the nation of Israel is situated uh, uh, primarily uh, about 150 miles at, um, north and south, uh, probably uh, could extend it to 200 miles. Uh, around the city of Jerusalem, and then east and west some 50 to 75 miles. That is the region where the Israelites will uh, stay as far as the earth is concerned. That was given them according to the Abrahamic covenant. And of course it will be even extended further during the millennial kingdom. So anyone who lives outside of that is considered one of the nations. They are different regionally. They have different geographical boundaries. Now, in the book of Acts, we have the Apostle Paul referring to this in chapter 17. Acts 
Acts chapter 17, verse number 26. Where it says, And God hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth. See, it's everywhere but Israel. You are considered not only a Gentile, but that's racial distinction. You're considered one of the nations. That's geographical distinction. <coughs> and hath determined the times before appointed. That is, there are some uh, peoples that have uh, been on certain turf, uh, certain geographical locations, and then all of a sudden God eradicated them. He simply annihilated them. And he allowed them to live for so long, and then they were done. But note what else God has set. The nations have the bounds of their habitation set in order to do what? That they should seek the Lord and find him. So the word nations is another Bible word that indicates a different region than Palestine and one living in that region. All right, there's a third word. Turn with me to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms 106. That word is the word heathen. Now, a heathen is one who has a different religion than that of Israel. In other words, they do not worship the true and living God, or as in the case mentioned here, there were some Israelites that sort of had their uh, foot in two temples, one in the temple of Baal or Moloch or Ashtaroth, and the other in the temple of Jehovah. They were uh, straddling the fence, so to speak, and God wasn't going to let them get away with it. And of course, uh, what we're going to study this evening is that there are some Christians like that uh, as well. Or there are some people who use Christian definitions, some people who even use somewhat of the Bible, but yet they are members of a cult, a group that doesn't truly worship the Lord Jesus Christ or his father. So we're in uh, Psalms 106. Let's look at verse number 44. They, referring to the nation of Israel, did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them. Now see, there were some nations of the Gentiles who were living on the land of Canaan. And before Israel could get the land, all of these Gentiles had to be destroyed. And there was a special reason for it. Because these nations were not only infringing on their turf, but these nations were worshiping another God and worshiping in a different way, in a strange way, an altered way than the way Israel was supposed to worship Jehovah. Note verse 35, and here's our word. They were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. They served their idols, which were a snare unto them. So, the word heathen gives us a distinction in religion. They had a religion. They had a god or gods. They had a, a, a pantheon of sorts, all types of gods, and uh, all sorts of religious uh, practices, which went all the way from uh, uh, temple prostitution to child sacrifice, uh, on and on we could go. In fact, it does talk about the sacrifice of their children. Verse number 37. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devil. Now, you could have this uh, big fella by the name of Baal, uh, who was uh, worshipped, and again, he was the god of the um, uh, fertility, he was the god of the seasons, bringing in uh, uh, rain and harvest and so forth. But then when you wanted to offer something to him, they would make him uh, this god who would look down upon a big belly, and he would have an open furnace there, and they would slide their children into his belly, which had a roaring fire, and they would literally um, uh, kill their children in this fashion. Note, it says, they shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. 
One of the reasons that I bring this out is just simply, we wonder why America has problems. We have uh, on the West Coast, uh, those that are, are rallying and rioting for gay rights and so forth. Uh, we have throughout our nation people who are pro-choice and pro-abortion and so forth. And literally what this is, is simply in the mother's womb, sacrificing a child to, to this God, Molech, uh, Baal, Ashtaroth, it doesn't matter what you, you call him or her, it's a different God, but you are actually sacrificing innocent blood in the very wombs of the mother. The only difference is it is sophisticated technology that's used rather than throwing a live baby into the fire. There's basically no difference. And then all of a sudden God hits a nation and we're stung and we're hurt and had the outcry. We've got to help these people, help them. Help them do what? Recover, reestablish themselves, only to go back to doing the very same thing. Uh, sometimes you have to wonder, remember, that suffering is this. Number one, we're associated with a curse. All of us are gonna have suffering touch our lives in one form or another. Secondly, it can be a blessing. The Apostle Paul was told, my grace is sufficient to see you through the suffering. You can turn suffering to blessing if you're a Christian, no matter what happens on the outside. But thirdly, it is a judgment upon those who, note, uh, verse number 39, defile themselves with their own works and go a-whoring with their own inventions. Our land is filled with those who um, are liberal in their thinking and are doing their own thing. Uh, I think of some of the uh, politicians and so forth, politicians' wives <laughs> even, uh, talking about marriage uh, being tantamount to slavery and, and the like. Uh, again, it's their own works, it's their own inventions. Uh, it's conjuring up things to do it their way, trying to be a good person, trying to set their own standards. Well, it says the land was polluted with blood and they're defiled with their own works and went a whoring with their own inventions. They were religious works. Here's my child, Molech. And uh, for a good harvest, I've got about 11 other kids here, for a good harvest, I'll give you the first and best of the bunch. Zoom, there, there he goes. Uh, or uh, the best of the bunch, uh, anyway, that, that, that I've got, or the youngest of the bunch, what have you. They would kill their children for the blessing of this God. Therefore, verse 40, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. And he gave them into the hand of the heathen. In other words, their enemies uh, ruled over them. All right, now, therefore, we have to be careful regarding three things. That as believers, we do not fall prey to the abominations, the gods, and the prayers of the heathen. Let's turn to the book of 2 Kings. The book of 2 Kings, chapter 16, verse number 3. where it says, But he, Ahaz, walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire, according to, and note this phrase, the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. He sacrificed and burnt incense in high places, uh, on the hills and uh, under every green tree. Abominations. Today we're living in a time when uh, those who are weird, uh, abominable, are held as models to be emulated. All of the talk shows have, uh, um, I was a transvestite, uh, gay, Nazi, something or another, you know, and oh man, we've just got to watch this show because th this is important, you know, Oprah's on and Donahue's on and so forth. It's an abomination. Why do people uh, want to know the business of people who are so weird and obnoxious? 
It's an abomination, the abomination of the heathen. Uh, they're worshiping their own God. They're doing things their own way and so forth. But it is a, a religious thing. All men basically are religious to the core, whether they worship themselves or the devil or what have you. And they're an abomination. Turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18. Book of Deuteronomy chapter 18. And we'll start reading with verse number 9. Where it says, When you are come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. Now, I don't uh, see... Uh, anybody except, as we pointed out, those who are uh, killing their children, uh, having promiscuity by way of sex, and then getting caught, and then killing their children. Um, but uh, so that may not uh, hit us directly as far as Christians are concerned. But the word abominations is toiba. It means a substance that is inwardly, actively, constantly disgusting or sickening. It's in the uh, feminine active participle. So it's a word that is uh, a noun, but it's one of those substance, uh, substantives where you have action. It's an abomination. It, it, it's something that constantly makes me upset, says God. Now, what could that be? Verse 10, there shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, hmm, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. If you've watched uh, TV uh, through the newscasts, um, oft times, and I've noticed it more here lately, the 900 numbers for consultations. And you'll find this attractive man or this attractive uh, uh, woman there. And they'll tell you how Edgar Casey and Nostradamus have made predictions that have influenced the lives of many. Just give a call and a quote, caring psychic. Yeah, they really care. As though somebody who were directing you into evil things cared about your soul. Yeah, they're re really on top of things for you. All they want is your money. It's an abomination. It makes God sick. And yet, we, I understand through the charts and through the daily uh, horoscopes and through things like Gene Dixon and the books and uh, the consulting things, that it is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's an abomination. And it's no wonder God hits America like he does. Now, uh, I understand what it is like, uh, having had just recently perhaps a little bout with, uh, with food poisoning, and it was uh, no one's fault but my own, actually. But uh, what had happened was I, I ate the substance, it was very good, but once it got into my just, di digestive system, here's what happened. The body realized but though it tasted good here, it was, it was uh, harmful to, to my system and it began to rebel. There was already some poison evidently in uh, the muscles and joints and it was absolutely painful. But uh, it wouldn't go down and it wouldn't come up. It just stood there and churned and absolutely made me wish that I was absent from the body and present with the Lord. It was, it was terrible. But that's what toiba means. <laughs> To, to, the, to the body, it's an abomination. It can indeed make one uh, sick. Well, the abomination here is, of course, referring to the Lord. And though God is perfect and never gets sick, by way of an anthropomorphism, he is letting us know how he thinks and feels about this type of activity. All right. Let's move on to the second thing, Psalms 96. Psalms 96. Now, toiba is the word abominations, but the word elalim 
is actually the word idols, not the word gods. Verse number five. For all the gods of the nations. Now you will remember we, we talked about a distinction. The Gentiles, nations, and heathen. Gentiles refer to the race. Nations refer to the geographical. Heathen refer to the religion. Well, why is the word nations here? Because the nations also had national deities that were worshipped. Israel had Jehovah, so the nations would have a national deity. Remember when the Philistines came in? They stole the uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant and took it into the temple of their god, uh, Baal. And uh, there was trouble there, and the <laughs> the angels evidently knocked the uh, statue of Baal down on its face and so forth. Well, they had national deity so that everyone in the nation came uh, uh, under the heading of you are this religiously. And of course, when Antichrist uh, uh, takes charge, that's what's going to happen. Everybody's going to have to take the mark and worship him so that they have uh, not only a heathen deity, they have a national deity as well. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. The word idols is Elohim. And uh, the psalmist has a play on words here. Elohim and Elohim. Elohim, the true and living God. Elohim meaning nothingness. And actually it means the opposite of Elohim. Elohim has the monopoly on substance. He is one God. He has existed eternally. Anything that we have comes by way of Him. As far as blessings is concerned, universe, substance, life, He breathed into our nostrils and, and made us a living soul. But if you worship a different God, you might see Him fashioned there, uh, because with the works of your own hands you have made a tree into a god, or a rock into a god, or a metal into a god. But that god actually represents nothingness, or uh, or there is a there is a demon behind it. But again, the demon can't bring to pass your need for salvation, your everlasting life. A demon cannot do it, and that's why there is a versus Elohim versus Elohim. All the gods are nothing, says the psalmist. Now, uh, chapter 97 here says, Confounded be all they that serve graven images, that boast themselves of idols. Elohim, nothingness. Turn with me to Isaiah 31. Isaiah 31 and verse 7. For in that day every man shall cast away his idols of silver and idols of gold, which your own hands have made unto you for a sin. Remember, it's your own works, it's your own invention, it's your own idols that you've made. I want to read something here that goes along with this and as to why God judges the heathen. Newspaper, Courier, Evansville. Some waiting at church say they saw the Virgin Mary. Cold Spring, Kentucky. Some of the thousands, and they say that there were about 6,000 people in this tiny town. Can you imagine? On, on a Sunday night, it's hard to, to get 16 people here to church. 6,000 people coming all the way from Pittsburgh by bus in order to see this apparition. I would love to put a, uh, uh, an advertisement in the paper. Tired of hearing questionable voices. Tired of waiting for questionable apparitions. I mean, they're questionable. They flocked to this small town, who, uh, and some of the 6,000 said they saw the Virgin Mary appear to them in a pine tree. <laughs> she didn't want to be at the church either, I guess. I don't know. But uh, 
I saw Mary, she says. Her arms were stretched out. I felt very happy. I was shaking and crying. I saw another testimony on television where she said, I saw her face and she was looking down and this way and that way. I saw the Blessed Mother. She had white hands and glowing lights around her. It's a wonder they said that uh, there were so many flash cubes that went off at, at uh, 12 o'clock midnight. It's no wonder she saw bright lights going all around her. She said, I saw Jesus as well and the cross. That's interesting. Jesus still has the cross and he totes it with him wherever he goes. It's also interesting that the Word of God says that heaven shall conceal him or keep him until the times of restitution of all things. He doesn't make personal appearances and neither does his mother. At midnight when the apparition was supposed to appear, um, according to an unidentified mystic, uh, talking about the priest, uh, he said, let's take a moment to welcome the lady into our midst. Most of the people held rosaries and some lit candles. Now, here's what I want to show you. Mrs. Klaus, Jean Klaus, came from Pittsburgh and said that when she saw the Virgin Mary, and I quote, she believed her rosary beads were turning into gold. Oh, that's fantastic, isn't it? Pitiful people. I'm here because the Blessed Mother is here and she is my patron saint. Idols, idols, a whole religion given over to fashioning figures after the likeness of men to pray to them. What are they? Elohim. But it's no wonder that God strikes America simply because that is where they're, they're heading. You can't get people to hear sound Bible doctrine, but you can gather a crowd of 6,000 across the nation to see some sort of face or appearance of, of Mary by a, a, a questionable uh, a priest. All right, let's move on then to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Matthew, chapter 6. The last thing we want to note is the prayers of the heathen. We do not want to get involved in their abominations. Their abominations are simply the practices uh, that they go through to feel secure about uh, themselves, to garner self-esteem, to look toward the future, to control the future. Uh, on and on we could go. Those are abominations to God. It's the antithesis of faith. Faith is trust in God. He holds the future. I don't know what it holds, but I know the one who holds it, God himself. It's, a, it's an abomination to, uh, to try to look into the future for the controlling of your future apart from God. Secondly, we don't want to get involved in going after their gods. And let me tell you, I, I, have, I had uh, somebody, it's been about a, a year ago, or someone who came intermittently to the church here and said, uh, Pastor, I wanted to talk with you. And so I said, fine, and I met with this person. And this person said, I hear the voice of Mary from uh, Medjugorje. Uh, it's over there near Czechoslovakia, I believe. And I believe that's the proper pronunciation of the town. But I hear the voice, and I want to go over there to meet with the Blessed Mother. I want to go and, and, and see and hear and take pictures and so forth for myself and have this apparition appear to me. And I simply said, why do you want to do that when you could come and see the image of the Son of God in His Word every Sunday and every Wednesday night right in our local church? You don't have to have, have this hope that you're going to see anything. You will see it if you get saved and trust in Him. You see, we're not going to get caught up in that uh, phony business, but the world is. All it is is a Christian psychic emotional experience. They understand that these type of psychics are wrong, so they simply go after this type of ex experience because uh, uh, one way or the other they want God's blessing. But they're doing it differently than his system. 
Now, there's another way that the heathen people do something to get blessing that's apart from his system. And that's prayer. We've taught for the longest time that all prayer is not correct praying. Even, even if we do it, if we're out of fellowship, the prayer of the wicked is sin. Take, let's see, verse number seven. Excuse me, verse five. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corners of the street. They have their reward. In other words, uh, that's fine. If they want to pray a public prayer, that <laughs> they'll do that. Uh, but when you pray, enter the closet. Shut your door. That doesn't mean you can't have public prayer, but the emphasis is simply this. There are those who say they want to be in the limelight all the time. Sure, I will pray if it means that others will see and think that I'm some sort of spiritual giant. But when it comes to praying in secret or staying in fellowship, pray without ceasing, you have to pray when you're alone. They didn't do it because they saw no need. No one was watching, but the Lord said God was. When thou, shut, when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father in secret. He'll reward thee openly. Now he says this, verse 7. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Now, the word for vain repetition, it's actually the two words, are represented in this one word here. Bato logeo. Batos was a proverbial stutterer. Uh, he just couldn't get it out uh, without um, being labored with his wording. Logeo means to speak or communicate verbally. But when combined, it means tedious articulation. Can you imagine a public speaker? Can you imagine somebody that got up here and prayed and took him five or ten minutes to get out one or two words because he stuttered so badly? It's tedious, not just for him, but also for the one hearing. And in this case, the one that's supposedly hearing is God. Who's it tedious to? It's God. Oh, no, this again. Didn't he just come to me with this request two seconds ago, four seconds ago? I mean, now, due to prolonged stuttering. Oh, why do we mention this in, in the prayers, the vain repetition? Simply because the very same article, many of them said that when they were waiting for Mary, not only did they light their candles, not only did they sing Ave Maria, they went through their rosaries many, many times. What is a rosary? It's nothing more than a numerical system to keep tabs of the same prayers over and over and over. You have a certain amount of beads and you go to bead one and you have this prayer and you go to bead two and you have this prayer and you go to bead three and you have this prayer. It's vain repetition and you say it over, over, over and over again. Blessed Mary, Mother of God, meet us in our hour of need, on and on that, that you go. What are they? Those are vain repetitions. And what, what does God say? I'm tired of hearing them already. It's the same thing. There's no substance there. They don't know me. I don't know them. They don't care about me. Just to use this thing as a fetish, a good luck charm. As long as they've got their rosary with, with uh, uh, Christ on the cross and they've got it around their neck, it's a good luck charm. Things won't happen to them that happen to other people who don't have this rosary. That's nonsense. They're not praying right to begin with. So the word simply means that God is absolutely tired. It's heathenish to pray in this fashion. And again, note verse number seven. This is the way the heathen pray. Do not use these vain repetitions as the heathen do. Why? For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. All right, now, let's go to the book of Romans and close this study out.
the book of Romans chapter 1. Now in this chapter, we're going to uh, see the point that we're trying to make. God warned Israel time and again, don't be like the heathen. Don't learn their works. Don't mingle among them. Be separate or different. Why? Well, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians that if you partake, that you're, you're the one hastening God's wrath upon these same individuals that you say you care about. Not only is the wrath going to fall on your head, it's going to fall on them. So be different than the heathen. Why? Verse 18, Romans 1. We'll show you what the heathen do and why we have to be careful not to get caught up in what our world is getting caught up in. And we'll do our best to explain that before the end of the study here. Our world is getting caught up in men helping men, making conditions better. But note it says the verse number, in verse number 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. I'd say a good bolt of lightning, good tornado, a good hurricane from heaven. Certainly a revelation of what the wrath of God can do against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do what? They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. That's why God judges. That's why God sins. Uh, the various things that happen to, to the people around the world. That's why a tidal wave can hit Nicaragua, which is uh, predominantly uh, Catholic as I understand it. Uh, that's why Bangladesh, where you have the Hinduism and Buddhism and, and the worship of Kali and those other uh, false deities that are horrible uh, deities. You can have tidal waves and flooding where thousands and thousands of people are killed. That's why you can have, as was in our paper not long ago, on the anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bomb. Why were the Japanese people bombed like that where thousands were destroyed? Well, for the very same reason that their ancestors put little boats in the waters with candlisms to pl uh, candles in them to placate the souls of the spirits, to calm them down. That's why they bring them food and pray to their ancestors. That's why God sends horrible judgments upon pockets of people. And we, we must be careful, though we're, we're concerned about them. Still, uh, we dare not question the Lord. He knows their hearts. You have groups of people who do what? Suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which may uh, be known of God is manifest in them. God has showed it unto them. Can you imagine? A, a holy, righteous, loving God says, here, I give you a revelation of myself. And they say, no, thank you. I don't want to know. Now, verse number 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And from evil imaginations become, become two things. Their own works, their own inventions. They changed the glory of God into an image made like the corruptible man. Birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Note, corruptible man. Mary's in the image of a man. The other patron saints that you have in Catholicism. But it's not just Catholicism. It can be in, in any religion that is different, worships a different God, or corrupts the true image of God. Wherefore God gave them up to the uncleanness of their hearts. Verse 25, they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. All right, now what two things can happen? Well, the bottom half of verse number 27 for happening number one. God is not going to let anybody get away with anything. They receive in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Now, literally, they receive in themselves that recompense of the error, which was fitting. Or we would say, just. Chapter 2, verse 6. God will render to every man according to his deeds. 
1 Timothy says that some men will have their sins judged in time, others will have them judged in eternity. Now, all unbelievers will have their sins judged in eternity, but as far as temporal punishment, there are some who will get the wrath of God upon them during time. And that's what Paul is addressing here. Those who are drug victims. Uh, I was talking with someone the other day where uh, the AIDS epidemic actually came from those who were cohabiting with the beasts of the field over in Africa. And it's no wonder that you have millions now in Africa that uh, have the HIV virus. That is weird. It's what they were doing back before uh, the time of Noah. And that's, of course, what the Lord says in the days of Noah. What were they doing? They were cohabiting with animals. And so now you have a cohabitation with animals and you get HIV and then it spreads through drugs and then uh, the rest of the various uh, ways that it is spread. But it's a recompense of error, which is fitting. It's just, you see. All right. So if this happens, don't let anybody uh, uh, tell you. And I understand that the psychologists have to say this to people. It's not, a, it's not a fault of your own. It's not a judgment of God, they say. I read it in the paper. Some of the various hospitals here said, come and see whether AIDS is a judgment of God. There's no doubt about it. It was a judgment of God. Uh, if you're out of fellowship, it's a judgment. All right, verse number 32. Here's where others can fall prey. Here's where Christians can take part. Who knowing the judgment of God. Hey, the wrath of God's revealed. God's going to eventually uh, burn up his fuse. He's going to come to the end of his, of his fuse. He's long suffering, that's true. But the fuse is going to go out and he's going to explode. Actually, the wrath of God is the word orge, which means a violent, righteous explosion of God. That's it, I've had enough. Boom, they're gone. We know that's going to happen. It's already happened. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at Noah and the ark. Uh, look at Pharaoh and, uh, and the firstborn. Uh, look at the Red Sea incident. Uh, time and again, we can say God has enough and he strikes who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Now see, we live in a world today where this happens and we, we all get excited and we'll, we've got to help these people. They're worthy of life. Well, the very God who caused the storm says they're worthy of death if indeed they're out of fellowship. If they're not out of fellowship, then they're gonna turn suffering to blessing. But we have to keep that in mind. If not, we're going to try to undo what God's wrath and judgment are, are, are trying to do, and that's get a hold of these folks. But in, in our hearts, we not only do the same thing by the buddy-buddy system in that sense, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now again, don't you dare say we're not compassionate, that we're not to help out where we can, do our part, and so forth. Of course we do. But we also have to understand that God wants to get a hold of, a, of, of large groups of people. And that's why, <laughs> that's why you have judgments where 35,000 over in, in the middle part of Russia there, several times, whole cities are just uh, uh, collapsed because of earthquakes and uh, the tidal waves and so forth. Why? Simply because they're worthy of death. God has had enough. If they're a believer in fellowship and they get caught up with this judgment, it's just simply absent from the body, present with the Lord, which is far better. <laughs> That's turning suffering to blessing, you see. That's fine, Lord. If I've got to go home with these heathen people, that's fine. I'll, I'll gladly go home. I've had enough of them anyway. Boom, up we go. But uh, I just I did this study simply because I want you to keep in mind that when God does something in this, in this fashion, it is a judgment because they had it coming. He'll render to every man according to his deeds. And they, they have it coming for three reasons. They're heathen. They do abominable things. They're worshiping the wrong God. And their prayers are nothing but vain repetitions to get them out of tight situations that really they're worthy of to begin with. 